Now, next we are going to have a panel discussion. Today, 60 to 70 percent of the tech stacks in the Indian startups, enterprises, and the e-government projects consist of open source software. And that has really helped our country save billions of dollars, which might have gone to buy the proprietary uh, ownership of those softwares. India is a country where there's like a lot of free software and open source uh, developers, and we need to leverage free and open source software a bit more strategically, not just that, uh, not just for cutting costs, but when we leverage free and open source software mostly uh, more in a better way, we can actually uh, get out of vendor locking or get out of proprietary software, which and we can actually own the data that our country has. So we are having a panel discussion where a lot of public policy experts will be joining us. So we'll be starting in like a minute or two. Uh, my name is Venkatesh Aryanan. I'm the public policy director for FOSS United. Uh, we are, I think, at a very interesting juncture where there is tremendous amount of usage of FOSS in India. Uh, most of the largest e-government projects in India, whether you talk of UPI, Aadhaar, uh, account aggregator, uh, GST, et cetera, et cetera, are all built on foundations of free and open source software. Although the final product itself, whether it's UPI, et cetera, is not uh, open source. Uh, we are also seeing, you know, huge amount of uh, push from the government into, you know, new areas like risk by computing, which is also heavily dependent on open source. Uh, also, if you look at uh, India, we are now the third largest uh, community on GitHub. However, you know, I think we are doing a fantastic job in terms of leveraging open source for, uh, you know, reducing cost, uh, delivering projects quickly, et cetera, et cetera. But I think there is a lot that needs to be done to drive innovation. Uh, another area from an open source policy perspective is that we have very good policies for open source, but uh, you know, we have a policy on uh, open source in e-government. We have a policy on, you know, collaborative development of source code within the government. Uh, so we have extremely good policies on paper, but uh, like with a lot of policies in India, you know, what is on paper does not really translate into practice. Uh, in this panel, we'll look at uh, a bunch of things. You know, why should engineers be involved in public policy? Uh, what can India do? to really go from you know, a tactical cost reduction kind of a usage of FOSS to a more strategic usage of FOSS. Uh, so let me quickly also introduce the panelists to you. Uh, Yatish uh, Rajavat uh, is a columnist, researcher, and founder of the Think Tank, Center for Innovation in Public Policy. Uh, he works extensively with state governments on a wide variety of policy issues. And he also runs this uh, Policy Talks with Yatish Rajavat podcast. Uh, this show is carried on Money Control, News 18, and uh, many other uh, channels. Uh, he is focused on creating a future that is sustainable and suitable for a populous country like India. Uh, Rohini is uh, a technologist and a Wikimedian and an interdisciplinary researcher. She is currently a fellow at Factor Daily and a consultant and advisor with some uh, non-profit organizations and businesses. She is an engineer by training, and uh, she has worked on several research and advocacy projects at the intersection of technology and uh, civil liberties. Uh, Prashanto is uh, a senior advisor of FTI Consulting, but uh, I think we wanted him here because um, he was famous for, you know, including Linux distributions along with PC Quest when he was the editor of PC Quest. How many of you have seen those uh, PC Quest magazines? How many of you have seen a CD-ROM or actually used a CD-ROM? <laughs> <laughs> so at, at one point in time, you know, uh, we used to wait for those magazines to appear because that was the internet download speeds were very slow and uh, that was the fastest way to get something installed on your hard disk. So uh, Prashant was also uh, famous because he built one of the first green homes in India. And he's been the president and editor of Cyber Media, the vice president at NASCOM, uh, many, many qualifications. I won't go into the details. 
Uh, Tarunima, of course, has been one of the speakers in Audi 2 today. <coughs> she is the research lead and co-founder of Tattle, an open source civic tech project building solutions to respond to harmful content, fake news, etc. Uh, Tattle's work include AI models to analyze multilingual and multimodal multi content, as well as moderation of gendered abuse. So let me, you know, quickly dive into the uh, questions. Uh, I'll start with you, Yatish. I think uh, we had this conversation and, uh, you know, I think the footprint of technology has grown enormously in the last few years. I mean, all of us carry mobile phones. Uh, most of these mobile phones and the technologies we use are, you know, built on open source. Uh, why, you know, why do you think technologists should be interested in public policy? And you also, in past uh, podcasts, you have spoken about yeah. code as law or policy. So, so, yeah. The last seven, eight years, uh, there has been a almost a noticeable shift in the way uh, the government works. Okay, the terms like e-governance, which we used to talk about ten years back, I have morphed into actually. Uh, digital infrastructures and what is happening because of the digital infrastructure is that the software engineer is actually more embedded in the public policy process than ever before and I'll give you one example of this um, if you go back 15 years uh, RBI used to come out with um, basically a payment policy okay and that payment policy would be followed by a notification. Uh, the notification would tell banks that this is how you will do the RTGS transfer, this is how you will do the IMS transfer, this is the amount of time you will take, et cetera, et cetera. Last 10 years almost, RBI has been coming what is called with a payment vision. No? And the payment vision says that we want to do this there is no notification now. Okay. So how is policy getting delivered and how is policy getting formulated? The policy formulation has now become a black box, but the notification has actually turned into a software code. And the policy has almost become a protocol in that code. So if, say three months back, uh, if I don't know how many guys noticed that you could not transfer money from your wallet to your account. Uh, now, there was no notification from RBI. There was no policy confabulation of sorts. Uh, what RBI said, it just made a little change. NPCI made a little change that you could not transfer money from the wallet to your account. Because a lot of people, were, what they were doing was that they were bypassing the tax process because now the tax authorities basically troll your bank account. So they were taking money in the wallet and using it for expenses. They're paying the credit card bills, they're paying uh, the electricity bill, they're you know, transferring it to their account, to their mother account, for, you know. Uh, so expenses were happening there. Now what has happened in this process? The software engineer has become, or the engineer has become very important in the policy making process. And we have not realized it. That this has happened because of the fact that, you know, a, a protocol is now basically a standard legislative policy. and. Um, there is another impact of this, that a lot of policy is now no longer going even through the legislative process. Now this might sound heretic and it might sound undemocratic and it might sound um, odd, but I mean, uh, some of you who have, who understand a little bit of policy making would have realized that, you know, there is always the parliament which is in place and that, that is where policy is formed and parliamentarians are supposed to pass that policy. But increasingly, policy making and policy implementation uh, is happening at the bureaucracy level. And within the bureaucracy, it is happening in the software. And within the software, it is happening by engineers. And unfortunately, those engineers do not realize the impact that they have. And that is where you and I have this discussion. And I felt, and I the reason I wanted to be here, I you know, almost invited myself <laughs> into this conversation, was because I have felt for some time now 
that the larger force community has to reintroduce itself into this process. So that neatly brings me to Rohini because she's an engineer who's also worked on public policy for quite a long time. But I think the really important point that you made was that code is becoming law now. And therefore, you know, engineers should be more involved with it. Rohini, you've been, you know, what would be your uh, quick summary on, you know, why engineers should be in, in interested in public policy? I think it should be both ways uh, because, uh, you know, uh, for example, in Anupam Gua session today, we heard that uh, engineers should be interested in law or policy or both. Uh, I often get the answer to, uh, you know, a lot of things I do, a lot of questions that I ask. I'm not a tech person. And that's, uh, you don't hear someone say, I'm not a medicine person, I'm not a f law person, I'm not a pharma person. And that word tech person kind of throws me off because possibly for them I qualify as a tech person. And for me, they are a tech person because if you are techy enough to you know, work in this domain or to use a laptop or to use a phone, you're techy enough to understand certain things. So I think it cuts both ways that people who are from a humanities or policies or law background should also cultivate so Rohi, and understand. I think today, if you look at the policy space, yeah. we have very few techies in the public policy discussion. You, you just came from a privacy discussion, and I'm sure 70% of the participants in the panel discussions were lawyers. Yes. So, you know. So you need a deeper and, uh, you know, uh, you, if, if you have, you need a deeper understanding of tech and if you have someone who understands the nuts and bolts, you know, someone who's gotten their hands dirty on it, uh, that's, that's invaluable in a, in a policy discussion or a law discussion. Uh, so I think it cuts both ways. Uh, and I'm saying it because today I've heard, uh, you know, the point that tech people should be interested in the other domain and I'm like, the reverse should also be true. Uh, yeah. Prashanto, yeah. Yeah, so, uh, you know, I, I'll just pick up from a few of the threads. Uh, you mentioned this discussion yesterday uh, on privacy. Uh, the interesting, th you know, there's a DPDP Act, and, uh, you, you know, whether you like it, don't like it, you think you're not involved with it, but it's going to affect all of you. There's going to be compliance, suddenly, that's going to be demanded of whether you're, you know, an open source related organization, or you are a nonprofit, or you are, you know, uh, something else. Uh, yesterday we spent so much time on that just discussing, okay, who, uh, am I a data fiduciary, am I not? So what is my compliance need? Uh, I think the, the relevant thing here for open source is that, and you mentioned Anupam Gua's talk, I think you also said this thing that policy is this, this lion and you know, you want to ignore the lion, but the lion is not going to ignore you. Very but well said. Yeah, I, I think that was very nicely put. Uh, the RBI example, I think, uh, brings me to this, the same question, you know, I was in NASCOM for a few years as vice president and uh, one of the things was uh, startups. We were, we were trying to work with startups and get them on board on policy. And startups have long felt that, hey, policy is not our, why are we, there are big companies doing policy. Now suddenly they realize that, you know, one little change, okay, RBI is an example. RBI issues clarifications, two line clarifications saying that you cannot load a PPI with credit, clarification done. Suddenly that brought down three unicorns overnight because their whole business models were co collapsed. Now you have to figure out that, now stepping back from the FOSS point of view, uh, I think, you know, I've been uh, involved with, from, from the PC Quest Linux days with FOSS. Uh, I think there's a lot more leverage we need to be able to look at doing. And one way to look at it is, you know, you mentioned that we are often up against uh, multinationals with very, very large budgets. You got to see how they're approaching this and why. And, it's not, I mean, there is this picture of the evil multinational, but the thing is all of these Google, Microsoft, Facebook, they've done a lot for internet penetration in India. They have engaged in a depth of conversation with the government and with projects where, uh, you know, the conversation is no longer about the software, whether you should use this or open source or, you know, not open source or whatever. It's simply because about the capability to execute a very large project, which is aligned or seemingly aligned with national priorities. And that alignment with national priorities today, you know, uh, Yatish mentioned uh, this, but if you look at it another way, this government is very into DPI, digital public infrastructure. There are massive mega platforms which are bigger than any platforms that have existed in the planet, okay? 
Now, we have, as a FOSS community, we have a certain view of those, okay? They are not really open source. They may say open network for digital commerce, but they don't follow the principles of open source finally in terms of source code, transparency, etc. okay? Now, that's a view we have. So, what's the next step? Next step is not to say that, okay, we won't engage with that because we've got to see how can we influence that in the way a large multinational corporation actually does that. And I'm actually glad to see that you actually have a policy and a legal approach to this uh, to actually take this thing bull by the horns and, you know, how to go forward and make this happen so that if we believe in a certain set of principles as far as the free and open source community is concerned, to make it happen, you've got to go out there and, you know, grab this policy bull by the horns. And which is where then you will really see that, okay, uh, you know, I mean, we've been speaking about uh, FOSS in the context of the national project called BOSS, BOSS, for a long time. That too has really, and it's been 20 years or something like that. Okay, it's not really seen take off because all of the government entities, the defense entities, by and large, they're using commercial software. And that's again because of the mode of engagement. You know, it's not that the companies are coming in saying, don't use FOSS, use this. They are going in and executing a project. So you've got to see how to actually take this policy thing up. And I would, you know, suggest one simple thing. Maybe we should look at working in the FOSS community, looking at what are, could be some of the outcomes or expectations that we would like from the FOSS community, where we see a gap in what's happening today in DPI or, you know, in large government projects, et cetera, where the open source framework could actually make a difference and why. And how can we make that happen, given that we have quite a few people who are, you know, like me and like many others who are at the intersection of FOSS and public policy. We are coming out with a DPI report and, you know, one of the fundamental things that we noticed, uh, we've covered around 30, 40 various DPIs, some in the pipeline, some at uh, conceptual stage and some obviously deployed and working. And there are 30 to 40 of them now, okay? Like the PM Gati Shakti itself is such a huge DPI that it touches almost everybody's life, okay? Now, there are two ways always to engage with the government. One is as PK was saying that you can ignore the lion and say that it doesn't matter to my life. Or you can say that it doesn't touch the areas that force was involved in. Or you say that all that you have been doing under the name of open source is not open source. And this is what open source is. And therefore, you should apply the principles of open source to every DPI that you are going to roll down. Because that is what your stated policy has, you know, in 2014 we passed it, that you, you have to comply, and that is the biggest year you have to bend, you know. So you actually help them not just solve a problem, you actually solve the problem in the interest of the FOSS community. Because then you would increase transparency across DPIs. I and that is a beautiful play for the community to engage you know, at a very uh, different level, you know, at a solutioning level. If you see even Microsoft, Google, all these guys are giving, like, for instance, Google is, is now playing the same game, uh, saying that we will take the DPI global, we'll take UPI global, we'll do this, we'll do that. But fundamentally, they're doing it because they want to be part of the solution. Yeah. Nobody wants to be part of the problem. You know? So yeah. I think somewhere there is this, this overhang and that is why I was kind of ribbing you on the patent thing earlier in the day. Yeah. That, you know, it's a battle. It's a good battle to fight. But there are better problems to solve. So you can either be part of a solution of a population level scale yeah. solution, or you can be part of a problem that is slowly, steadily becoming irrelevant in the larger ecosystem. You know, I'm sorry to put it no, that way, but I, it, is, it is like that. So, I'm glad that you know the whole digital public infrastructure conversation came up because, uh, and the point you made about uh, the fact that you know they are called open but then do not follow the principles of open source. Uh, I think many of the policymakers themselves do not really understand, you know, what should be when should they be using the term open. In fact, uh, we did intervene with uh, NPCI when they said we have open source beam, but uh, when we actually scratched under the surface, we found that they have bilateral arrangements and you know, if you have a bilateral arrangement with NPCI, they will give you the beam source code. So that is not open source, you know, so we had to educate them and 
you know, we wrote letters, we kind of, then they finally understood and that they said, okay, we, you know, we, we, uh, we, re, we you, you misapplied this particular terminology. Uh, I'm also glad that the DPI conversation came in and I'll, you know, maybe Rohini, since you've, you know, worked with or observed some other governments and how they have engaged with citizens, I'll come back to you. But uh, Tarunima, I want to come to you and uh, you have, uh, uh, you know, as part of Tattle, uh, one of some of the software that you have created are designated as digital public goods by the Digital Public Goods Alliance, which is a part of the UN. Uh, so, you know, give us a little bit of color on that. And, uh, you know, it's also the work that you are doing actually has a huge policy put footprint because fake news, et cetera, has become such a gigantic menace for society. So, you know, what is the policy engagement that you have? How do you work with? How do you think about working with policymakers? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll answer that, but also I had a line of thought going uh, yeah. with what everyone had said, so I'll, I'll, I'll sort of just add my <laughs> comments for that as well. I think one thing um, we shouldn't do is take the strides of force over the last two decades for granted. Uh, and we should remember that you know in 1996, 1997, nothing about open source was obvious, that it would succeed even as a way of um, economic growth, something that we recognize now. This was not obvious then. Um, and, and that was actually a time when people felt that they were losing, like the engineers and a lot of the people in the FOSS community felt that they were fighting a losing battle. And I think that's why they were engaging so proactively uh, with lawmakers. There was a lot of, you know, um, whether it was through EFF, there were just a lot of, uh, there was uh, just a lot of desire to change uh, or move levers wherever they were available to ensure that force thrives. I think what's happened now, and in part, uh, you know, as Yatesh was saying, was that we've, we're using that open source terminology, um, at least it's in the zeitgeist, right? So like we all sort of now fuzzily know that, okay, open source is good, it, it leads to innovation, it leads to economic growth. Um, but uh, we don't really know, I guess, the nuts and bolts of it, right? When is something truly open? And so even in the DPI conversation, we're using all the, the words of uh, openness and we're using that language, uh, but we all do need to engage, and I think even as technologists, uh, should not take the, that progress of 20 years for granted and assume that it's going to stay around for the next 20 years. And so I think that's also one of the reasons as FOSS contributors, as technologists, we should be very careful or what's happening in policy, because of course, everything that's happening in tech policy changes product directions, but it also means a lot for whether FOSS as a community succeeds and thrives in the way you know, we are seeing in this uh, forum today. So that was just my general sort of comments from what everyone had said. Uh, I think just to give a background on, um, you know, of course, I, I can talk about how, I, I mean, because we are working our um, work intersects, so whether it's in the misinformation space, it intersects very closely with uh, a lot of the policy moves. I think one good reason to do the work we are doing in the open source fashion is that it lets us talk about a lot of the challenges that you face, whether it is in moderation, um, you know, whether it is in terms of like solution building on encrypted platforms. Um, it lets us talk about a lot of that uh, transparently. And so then we can enter the policy space um, yeah, we can enter the policy space and, and be kind of honest in a way that say, if you are in a um, sort of profit driven or uh, you know, VC led uh, startup, you might not be able to do it because you cannot be absolutely transparent about uh, you know, things that have impact your business decision. So I also feel like um, in some ways for all of us who work in the FOSS community to think of that intersection with um, social issues more critically in that FOSS as an approach can actually enlighten policy making as well, right? So when you are building in the open, use all of those insights to um, intervene in critical policy debates because you can speak about it in the way other people probably cannot. So I just have one uh, follow up and partly it's, it's a question to, you know, you mentioned that uh, so much of the DPI has built on FOSS but the final product doesn't follow the principles of force. So, uh, you know, how do you push back against now? Uh, in your earlier talk about on AI, you did mention that, you know, Sam Altman's uh, the, the open AI thing, you know, with chat GPT, I think after two, they stopped giving the source code because they felt that it could be used for malicious use, et cetera, which is often an argument the government has, okay, that now what could be some good arguments against that? And one of them was, you know, 10 years ago, I made this proposition to Metis that, 
uh, put all of the software which are being developed for as pilots for different states, different districts, etc. Open source them, uh, let them be reused by other government departments because you know police apps. Every police department is building its own app with its different interface and it's paying PwC or somebody you know to do a. Uh, I mean, or the consultants are charging five times for the. Same software. Uh, abs exactly. So the consultants obviously are making a lot of money in this, but this is one argument. I'm wondering if there are other, like if you take the AI argument itself, how do you push back against that argument? And can you draw on that to push back against this government argument that, hey, this is, you know, UID, etc. There is a proprietary nature to this. So the source code is something we can't give, even if we build it on open source or something like that. So there are two or three very powerful arguments which uh, which derive themselves from the open source community itself. Uh, and one of them is that uh, because these are, you've classified them as infrastructure, and infrastructure is something that is supposed to be built by the government for the public. I mean, that is the, it's a public good. And a public good is, uh, technically speaking, you should not charge for a public good. But uh, um, if you do charge for a public good, it should not be built using public money. So th that is the most powerful argument here, uh, that uh, uh, this is public infrastructure, hence it has to be open sourced one, therefore it sh should be completely transparent. Uh, if a bridge is built, now it is mandatory that um, the name of the contractor is actually you know, uh, put up somewhere uh, near that bridge, saying that this guy built that bridge in this year. Okay, uh, This much money was allotted to that person. Even this toll bridges have... Even toll bridges have to... You know, there's a, there's a yellow um, board, if you notice it, it says that this bridge has been built by this contractor for this much money. The same thing should apply for digital infrastructure. And if it applies, uh, then who would play the role of ensuring that that code is transparent? So only a software engineer can do that. You know, you can't expect a lawyer to do that. You can't expect a policymaker to do that. Which is the community that has expertise in it? The FOSS community has that expertise. May have to upgrade it to become more than, um, you know, I, I, I don't know. Maybe it is a little bit of policing that they will have to do to ensure that the transparency is happening to the limit that it is supposed to happen. If NPCI has not opened it up and has done bilateral, I mean, the FOSS community should actually file a RTI or a PIL in the Supreme Court saying that NPCI is a public good and its uh, code has to be transparent, it has to be opened up. That's the, that's the PIL which obviously becomes uh, yeah. relevant and important here. Yeah. Everything that the DPI community is doing, um, FOSS community has to be engaged in that. By I think there the challenge or the difficulty is that, I mean, FOSS projects are typically something that you have built or you know contributed to or you're using so you're familiar with it therefore you contribute back to it but uh, these are very top down projects so i think it is a bit of a challenge to kind of you know be involved and contribute to you know dpi projects it's not impossible but uh, but i think i take the point on what you mentioned about you know reusability of code across different state governments uh, i think the point you made was about auditing and transparency of the software source code. Uh, I want to move to a slightly different point, uh, and you know, Rohini, we were discussing that uh, just now. Uh, in terms of the citizen-state engagement around technology, and today, if I look at say the FOSS community and the government, we are poles apart. You know, we just no. There is absolutely no communication between the government and the FOSS community, and you know, the the all the DPI projects in India are seen as very top-down very little citizen engagement. Uh, so you have looked at other governments and you know what are the best practices that we can learn from in India? There are a few definitions to openness. Uh, and one of them is that it is characterized by transparency and collaboration. So the cornerstones are transparency and collaboration. We've discussed transparency a, a bit, so I'm not going into that. But if it's not collaborative, then it's not open. So uh, you know some of the initiatives that we just discussed, they're not really collaborative. Like it was one entity or a group of entities that came together. And then like transparency about the 
uh, you know, group of people itself. What are their contracts with the government if they made it with the government? What is the nature of their contract? Even if they did it as a volunteer, um, even if it's a company that did it as a volunteer, uh, yeah, what, what was their contract with the government since they made digital infrastructure for the government? So you're not a private citizen who's doing a hobby project, right? Uh, so, uh, again, the question is, who is collaborating? What is the nature of the collaboration? What are the terms of engagement? Uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, in terms of... Uh, so some countries like Taiwan seem to have done a good job of it. You know, for example, yeah. uh, during COVID, uh, there were, you know, these APIs that were available. People could, you know, use those APIs to construct software to find masks where yeah, the yeah, yeah, yeah. are available. Yeah. Yes, Such yeah, coming to that. Uh, so uh, in Taiwan, for example, uh, uh, the government did public hackathons and it, uh, you know, the Taiwanese government is one of the governments that leverages the use of open source and community participation, community collaboration, voluntary assistance with the government very effectively. Uh, so during, uh, you know, the pandemic years, uh, they did public hackathons to solve some of these problems. And uh, the pandemic was a time when, um, you know, trust deficit, distrust was very high amongst everyone because, you know, you were afraid if the person standing next to you is going to give you COVID. Uh, so again, in, inherently with the government also, even like in what are considered developed countries, the, the, the citizens did not uh, trust the contact tracing app, for example and there was a very low rate of adoption. Uh, so having an initiative where the people build solutions for themselves, uh, you know, that pushed uh, a, a lot of um, uh, uptake uh, of, of these solutions, plus in general, a culture of trusting, uh, there was already an existing, uh, you know, baseline, there was already an existing culture of having these sort of initiatives and trusting uh, the government. I think uh, we'll also reach out to the government agencies from FOSS United perspective. Uh, we Last year, we had Abhishek Singh come and speak at uh, India FOSS 2.0. Uh, and one of the things he mentioned is that uh, government software developers is that they are very scared to put their code out in the open because they're schooled in a very different way of thinking. And they feel that if we lay, you know, put our code out in the open and it is criticized, what will my boss think of me, et cetera. So there is a huge cultural mindset shift that we have to work on. And I think it did help that, you know, in Taiwan, the IT minister was a very tech savvy uh, and a fairly young generation, uh, you know, minister. Yeah. Uh, we, let's see, I think we hope to kind of bring some of that cultural change here in India. So, so uh, like if this is like a party that... You want to this is like a party which FOSS has not been invited to, okay? <laughs> and this party has been going on for the last six, seven years, okay? Now, uh, either you can wait for that savvy IT minister to appear and solve the problem for you, <laughs> for the community at large, or you muscle yourself into the party. And the only way, and the biggest muscle the FOSS community has is the community. You see, you, 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 you are ignoring the fact that uh, you are the only organization which has a community around it, which has been active not for, you know, one or two years or, you know, even the DPI community comes, uh, comes together only for a project and disbands itself and disbands itself naturally uh, and goes away. So, I don't know where the Aadhaar community is, where the Beckon community is, where the UPI community is, all of them have gone away, you know. But here, this is not that community. So the very, f your biggest strength is your number. And to get invited to the party is that you represent the number. And therefore, by default, the government has to, in any DPI build up, you have to be the collaborative party. And all community engagements, whether from iSpirit or from, um, you know, the cohort, the beckon cohort is like it's a cabal now cohort or cabal whatever you want to call it um, <laughs> has to work through you guys so i mean like can, can I yeah there's a lot of bridge building that needs to happen there yeah, yeah. 
I, I actually think it's, you know, of course we can think about how FOSS community can get involved in the product side of GovTech, right? But I actually think we should think about how we can rally the government to play an enabling uh, role, right? So for example, how does, uh, so the example that Rohini is mentioning, which is that the government is creating the space for citizens to come together and come up with solutions. Um, and similarly, for example, can you build legitimacy for open licenses? Um, can you ensure that any research that is publicly funded is uh, created under an open science, open data, open source, open hardware license, right? So I think there is a lot that the government can do in terms of playing an enabling role, which I think is actually far less contentious and it, it grows the community as well. Um, and maybe that's also what the FOSS community should focus on, is, it, is playing that educative role for the government so that they can then play the enabling role for the ecosystem. Um, I feel like the intervention in products is actually very uh, challenging because it, inherently when you're building GovTech, there is a, there is a hierarchy and, and there's, a need that you, there's a need for um, gatekeeping because ultimately that service is affecting a lot of citizens. But, uh, one of the interesting things is that all DPIs that have come up, they have not come up from the government side. Okay? It is actually a misnomer to believe that they came up, the idea itself came up from the government. Uh, they all came up from the uh, DPI world, so to say. The non-profits so who work on The non-profit space. So ONDC didn't come from the government. It came from the beck and call team. Okay? The honest, Diksha, all these didn't come from the government. They built it as a product and they gave it to the government. And the interesting thing that they did, which make it acceptable to the government, was that they said, you take the credit. We don't want the credit. So hence, people assume that UPI was built by NPCI. People assume that Arogya Setu was built by the government. Or the digital logger was built by the government. Or ONDC is owned by the government or built by the government. So, I think that there, has, there is a lot of learning in that process. I know there is this discomfort with product, but there is something that, there is something that bridges all these products. So somewhere down the line, the ONDC will bridge with UPI, will bridge with the uh, credit disbursement blockchain that RBI is building, will bridge with the GST network, will bridge with the income tax network, and all this data will flow with each other. And th that is again a product. So I yeah. think the point again here is that you know, the government has a very top-down way of implementing some of these things, whereas the FOSS community is a very bottoms-up kind of a community. So I think there is a, uh, shall the twain meet, I think there's a lot of work to be done from both sides, not just from yeah. the... So I have a couple of uh, points on this. So one is if you look at how uh, these large multinational firms actually approach this. You know, why do they volunteer? Uh, why do they volunteer their time? And it's not always for a product, right? It's very often for projects. It's often for large e-governance thing where they go in and will do, you know, a lot of initial work. A lot of support to ministries is actually coming from uh, Big Four and, you know, other consultants and so on. So obviously that engagement leads them to participation in projects and, you know, things like that. So you've got to look at this, you know, I put it in quotes, but alignment with national priorities. What are those national priorities and can you go ahead of, you know, there's some stuff which is top down, but there's a lot of stuff of unsolved problems out there. Okay, number two, there's a lot of things which are state subjects. Okay, and they're all being replicated and the states are stumbling and discovering and rediscovering themselves. A lot of them are exploring tech around, so for example, this whole thing around emergency care systems, trauma care, common number, we don't have a common number, we don't have a 9-11. Okay, there's a lot of tech which is waiting to be actually identified and discovered there. So it's really, I think it's, it's up to, and I understand the FOSS community is not one entity, you know, like whatever, like iSpirit or India Stack or whatever, even that is not one entity, but it is far more cohesive. But uh, this would be a great thing to do, maybe through the hackathons approach, et cetera, to identify the top maybe two, three things where you don't have this huge entry barrier of a central government DPI thing which has already decided what it wants to do and how it wants to do it, but take up other challenges and there are plenty of those. That's a good point. I think we are getting close to our time. Uh, if there are any questions, let us uh, take them from the floor.
If not, we'll quickly you know, do a summary round. Any questions? Uh, Okay, you'll have to repeat that. I got bits of that. So, uh, How do you deal with privacy issues when the data, data? Possible, if, possible issues if we are, you know, implementing open source projects. Uh, I mean, you know, right now we have a DPDP Act with significant challenges and gaps in it. Uh, okay, there are significant exemptions, for example, for government entities. We are into that whole debate of, you know, so. Uh, uh, I'm not really sure there's one answer to this because uh, depending on what type of entity you are, you, there will be you know some onerous responsibilities and uh, so on on you. I don't know if somebody else has a different uh, take on that. So I think if you're working on the software, there is no issue yeah. as such. You know, if you're working on the government side and implementing that software you you know running data through that software etc that's when the privacy issues really come in but from a fos community perspective if we are helping build some government software but without really actually handling the data then i don't see an issue with it yeah i mean just to add to that i i, I sort of assumed uh, you were talking in terms of principle uh, that you you know you may have certain principles about but the fact is that, yeah, uh, in terms of liability, it's only if you are a processor and you're, you're processing data, you're not a processor, you're a fiduciary, okay, that's when you begin to have responsibility, or you are actually supplying an ongoing service to this government entity and you're contractually bound in some way, okay. But uh, there are obviously a lot of questions on principle. I mean, for example, a lot of the DPIs actually end up bypassing some of the federal structure. You know, you take COVID, health is a state subject, but COVID said, Within weeks, it said that you know you ha everybody has to register directly on COVID. It's centrally administered and yeah. so on, yeah. and it bypasses that. So that's a different problem, not exactly what you stated. But privacy itself, uh, there are many challenges if you are part of a system which is going to be supplying, processing data, etc., for a government entity, but not developing software. Actually, it is in an interesting way. It's it's a great opportunity because we are going to enact and implement these laws uh, and there are a couple of them which are basically uh, targeting both privacy and security. Uh, there is an opportunity for the force community to play into that space because moment uh, the government says that uh, the account aggregator is a data fiduciary and he follows a certain rule, uh, why can't the force community be a data aggregator? Because it follows uh, all the principles that the account aggregators are supposed to follow. And it does better at it because it has um, distributed ownership. There is no single owner as an organization. A, uh, the code is transparent and audited by, can be audited by any third party anywhere, which cannot, is not the case in uh, the case of account aggregator. Though the RBI has said that the account aggregators structure and architecture has to be audited by them. But RBI does not have the capability to you know, ensure that it is fully compliant. Okay? And I don't know how they're going to do it, frankly speaking. But if the same problem were to be put to a larger community and say that you do the transparency audit of an account aggregator or a data fiduciary, I think RBI will benefit for them. So I mean, I think there is an interesting role for all of you to, in, to play into this changing landscape of privacy, security, and redefine it for, from a community perspective, which is, you know, all of you. Interesting ideas. I, I couldn't see who was making the comment, sorry. Can you just raise your hands? Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. Any other thoughts, any questions? Uh, if not, we'll just quickly wrap up. Hello? Hi. Uh, so, uh, Venkatesh talked about both the top-down and the bottom-up approach, right? 
Um, I think what I want to add is, and also get a comment on, is in, in how our large DPGs in India, which are now products for the world, have come, are also in ways power has translated from programmers or certain set of groups that then have now become products for every, every citizen in the world, every citizen in India, right? Uh, one of the things that open source uh, projects offer is a uh, way for anyone else to contribute, have grievance ready to sell. So if I'm talking about inclusion, if it's for a colorblind person or if it's for a certain language, someone can extend it and build it. But when it's done in what could be called as open washing and then it becomes a DPG, uh, the way for government uh, uh, grievance ready to sell or extension that offers from the government is not available from an open source platform is not available. So this is a way to kind of uh, counter or circumnavigate both of these. So uh, if this is something that the FOSS community is uh, is challenging or trying to find ways around, how do you folks see they engage and solve this? You have actually uh, put together a problem that is looking for a solution from the community. Uh, UPI is now being adopted in 26 odd countries. Okay, now who is going to? The, so the government is so Brazil and Spain have just taken the code from GitHub and implemented it. Okay, so they have not reached out to NPCI, they have not reached out to the government, and they've just done it on their own. Okay, now their assumption is that uh, there is no bugs in this code, everything is clean, it is open source. Their assumption is that it is open source, okay? But it is not as we know it, okay? So there is no community supporting this, except the one which built it. And that project team has been long disbanded. And there are 22 other countries which are trying to do something similar in some manner, okay? UAE and all are taking direct support from NPCI, but most countries are also picking up the code. So there is a role again for the FOSS global community to come up and say that, if you follow the principle that the open source world demands, the community will step in to support these products as open source products. Yeah. So that the top down actually becomes a lateral world support. And you know, uh, the, the problem that they're going to face in the next three years becomes a solution that the community offers now. I think that's a great point. You know, the thing is, at this point in time, my observation has been that most of these DPGs have been, you know, you, it's been built in a kind of a proprietary model uh, by, you know, software services companies and then thrown over the wall and, you know, there's an open source license that is slapped on it. And uh, in one of the conversations with Donald Logo, I think he put it uh, beautifully. He said, DPIs are open source but without a community. And if you say that, you know, the three pillars of open source are collaboration, community, and the shared ownership of knowledge. Uh, with DPGs, you don't have, at least in most cases, except Tattle may be an exep exception, you don't have a community. You have an open source license attached to it, but you do not really have, you know, collaboration, the shared ownership of knowledge in the, in the real sense, not just in terms of, you know, having the code over the wall, but in terms of knowledge transfer, people involved in developing the software, being involved with the open source community. So uh, I think there is a room for civic engagement. Uh, I think the government will have to take a step forward and say that we want to not just you know, create software, but we also want to engage with the community. And I think from our side as a FOSS community, I think we have to probably get over our deep suspicion of the government and maybe take, take a step forward and say that, you know, hey, we are willing to participate in you know pe projects that are of the larger social good yeah just one quick one to add i think there was a couple of references you made to other things along the way which bring up interesting things for the community to engage in you you mentioned you know accessibility i think in some context so uh, that's a place where the community has potentially a huge role you know very quickly get to a stage where the uh, the ui ux you know it it draws in from uh, let's say the the refined experience of google search you know, it's something, it's, it's, it's not an accident. Okay, by and large, a lot of the government apps and websites are hugely problematic. We've gone very quickly into digital payments without recognizing some of the fundamental problems that, you know, somebody giving cash, I give cash to you, you can't go wrong, you know, I'm receiving your, on an app, 
debit and credit, I mean, it's caused so much of fraud, simply where you think, oh, you're getting paid, but actually you are sharing an OTP. And you, okay, these uh, experiences, the, the UI, UX part, this is where the community actually plays a huge role. And this top-down DPI approach is not very good in taking in feedback and quickly changing uh, you know, the, that experience. That is one place where there is a very significant role. And there are so many of these localized, you know, like take transport, you know, you've got, of course, Uber, Ola, Blue Smart, and all of that. But you've got a lot of localized transport things. So there is Namma, Yatri, okay, which I was asked yesterday to install, so I've installed today and so on. But there is this requirement for auto unions all over the country to be able to, you know, this should be an open source community driven app, which is open to all of these ones. I mean, if we're doing closing remarks, I can do that, yeah. Um, I mean, it is related, but I, I think, uh, thanks, thank you, but we're not the only ones, there's Glyphic, there's Bahamni, I think there are a couple of um, us on the DPG registry, and um, I think, you know, it's, it's, un, it's the world that we have to live with, or live in now, is that we are in the same bucket as a lot of more top-down, as you said, open source projects that are thrown over the wall. But with a license slapped on, right? And and we are in the same world, uh, and we have to kind of, um, unfortunately, because as open source is getting validated, you know, the DPG license, all of these things, the institutionalization then leads into whether the UN uses your software or not, whether um, what sort of funding comes to it. So we all have to engage with these institutions and the, the formalization of open source in some ways, and at the same time have to consistently clarify why or how this is the right way of doing open source, whereas maybe some of the other models are not. Um, and, and I think that's just the work that needs to be done and that we all should engage with. But also not to, to be trusting or a little bit more trusting of the government, but also to not be dismissive or pessimistic about the whole entire open source community. So what is happening with DPIs is not, the is not a reflection of the entire open source community. And we should just try and assert that um, you know there is a different way of doing it, and uh, there is the sort of uh, the more puritan way of doing it as well. So uh, I, I think uh, we've kind of covered a lot of ground. Uh, I just like to reiterate that uh, there's a lot of learning to be done from uh, companies and entities which have successfully navigated public policy to you know really be entrenched so uh, invaluably that they're irreplaceable. And you've got to see what, you know, you may disagree with parts of what they do and what the end objectives are, etc. But you've got to look at, if you believe in a cause and a mission uh, and transparency and collaboration, then you've got to figure out what are the ways to actually bring those into public goods, into what citizens are. And if there's a certain direction that has, you know, been shown the way as it were, we've got to, I mean, we cannot isolate ourselves and hope that lion will sort of ignore us. You know, we've got to go out and grab the lion or whatever is the right metaphor for it. Uh, so quickly, uh, we already have false policies in place. And this is something that I've said on many forums before, but uh, implementation is, you know, uh, something that we've consistently been docked with. So even if we have had some way of measuring implementation, because, you know, there are caveats in the policy or, you know, there's often a lack of will and you've been involved with, you know, the, the development of some of those policies. So even if we can improve implementation to some level, uh, that will also, you know, generally improve a lot of things. So, I mean, I will just leave you with one thought, which is, uh, Relevancy, you know, um, if the FOSS community is not relevant in this new world, uh, then irrelevancy will happen much faster than you can imagine. And the relevancy will not happen by labeling the government or the uh, what is happening in the ecosystem as top down or not in my backyard or not in my rule bucket or whatever. Relevancy will only happen if the community decides to become relevant. And the biggest opportunity in that relevancy is not just engagement. The biggest relevancy in that is that there is a possibility of creating global corporations, you know, just by supporting these infrastructures globally. So if UPI becomes the counterpart of SWIFT, in 100 odd countries, there will be an organization that will be supporting that infrastructure. 
and if that organization is a counterpart of a red hat like organization which comes out from the community imagine there will be a couple of billionaires sitting out in this room you know so look at it from the f the international uh, uh, perspective too and hopefully those couple of billionaires will be supporting fast united and organizations like that so on that note uh, thank you very much i think uh, the the high level summary i can derive from this conversation is that you know the fast community needs to also you know take some proactive steps in engaging with the government uh, push the government to implement policies better uh, not look at you know dpis as a very top down uh, infrastructure uh, the other part which i think rohini you brought out was that and you taruni me also that i think governments also need to create an enabling space for the fos community to come forward and collaborate rather than you know have these enclosed spaces where you create software in skunk works and then throw it over the wall put a label on it and you know do the open washing saying that hey this is open so i think there is bridges to be built uh, steps to be taken from both sides but uh, and trust to be built between both the fos community and the government uh it's a long slow process it requires patience and persistence but you know as fast united we'll work on it thank you so much thank you all of you for joining us <laughs>